All right, we have this same intro again, so I'm going to skip over it. If you want to see that intro, watch the last video that I... Ice Combat 3 Electrosphere. Oh, did that... Okay, did that... Uh, whatever. Okay, Ace Combat 3. Actually, the fourth game in the series. Because there was Ace Combat, but before Ace Combat, there was Air Combat. And I guess they think Ace Combat is a catchier name, or... <laughs> Perhaps there was some sort of a trademark uh, problem. But there was Air Combat, which was an early PS1 game. Then there was Ace Combat, which was a little later. Then apparently they had a lot of these. You know, I wasn't big in the flight sims in the PlayStation 1 era, or really ever. <laughs> I mean, I play some Microsoft Flight Simulator every once in a while, and like, I like World War II era combat flight sims. These, um, these modern day flight uh, sim combat games don't really speak to me, but I do think that this is kind of a... Impressive what they were able to do with the PlayStation 1 hardware. I mean, I don't remember if Ace Combat won. I mean, I played Bogey Dead 6 for a little while. But this definitely is, like, a pretty significant improvement. I mean, you're not going to get close to... You're not going to get close to anything. So you can have, like, low detail textures and low... Uh, low geometry models for the environment and the buildings and all that kind of stuff. So you can get away with having an environment stretch off pretty far in the distance and have it, s have it still look pretty good and all that. So that's why this game looks as good as it does. PlayStation 2, I think, made a huge leap beyond this in terms of... Well, I mean, like most everything in the PlayStation 2. Made a huge leap in terms of what it could look like and all that. For the same reasons. I think the big... Uh, oh, missile alert. Well, you got something like Colony Wars, which I think I have a demo disc of somewhere. When I get to that, that'll be cool. Colony Wars, where you had a flight sim, but it was like a sci-fi flight sim. You could not bother with an, uh, rendering an environment. So you could put all of your rendering budget into the... 3D models of your spaceships and all that kind of stuff. That was awesome. Oh, jeez. I was... I was using my right rudder the entire time. Thinking it was the throttle button. I wonder I was having such a hard time controlling and tracking enemies. The thing is, dogfighting in sort of modern flight sims. Not quite realistic. I don't think enemy aircraft are going to be within visual range majority of the time, because jets just are so fast. It's hard to track an enemy when both of you are moving at such insane speeds. But you slow everything down a bit when you start doing older style things like um, like a World War II flight sim. Or if you have a sci-fi flight sim where what you're dealing with is not based on reality anyway, you can set a speed and no one's going to question it. Set a slower speed where everything is easier to play with, like uh, Wing Commander, or Colony Wars, or Mega Boost, or whatever. And no one's going to question it. Alright. Uh, I think we got the idea here. I'm going to... There's one fighter left. Ah, missed him. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to bug out of this one. Can't stay here forever. No, no. Out. Get out. Get out. There we go. <laughs> no, I'm not... Nah. Okay, wait a sec. Alright, so I had to back out. Silent Bomber. Don't know what this is. Like I've mentioned a hundred times before, it's almost without doubt that I've played every single game on these demo discs. These were ones that came off of um, came off of the official U.S. PlayStation magazine, so it was my drip feed of games. I mean, it was 
I think a subscription to the magazine would cost $30 per year. So it's fairly expensive as far as, as far as magazine subscriptions go. But the value that you got out of it was enormous. I mean, not only did you have the magazine, which was all right, I guess. Oh, Japanese uh, voiceover. This actually looks pretty good for a PS1 game. But you would have... I'm skipping over that because I can't understand him. <laughs> you would get the demo discs. Now, not every... Not every issue had a good assortment of demos. Uh, this is a very Japanese game. The circle button is the confirm button as opposed to the X button. Which is not normal for... Oh, shit. <laughs> Is that going to... Oh, okay, it's not going to explode until I tell it to. Not every demo disc was going to be great. You were going to have a lot of crap. But it was always something. And you got a chance to play a lot of things before you make a decision to buy it. And the majority of the time, I would just not even think about buying something. But the demo disc would be something to play. Get away, bro. Oh, I need two of them. You know, I I think I didn't want a tutorial just so I wouldn't have to sit through this crap. Like, thanks, I can't understand what you're saying. I know you're telling me to do something, but I don't know what it is. You know, I can totally imagine the first time I played this, I didn't get all the way through it because <laughs> I'm seriously considering backing out of this demo I should probably stick it out <sighs> yeah okay oh my god what am I doing wrong I can't understand you. All right, we're done. <laughs> NCAA Final Four 2000 basketball, college ball. Uh, basketball games, NBA Jam. That was my jam. The I'm not sure I ever played the arcade version of NBA Jam, but the SNES version was the one that I had, that I had really clung to, and it was very arcadey. Very arcadey. This I don't know. I imagine it's not. You're not going to get an arcadey college ball game. Hello, everyone. Glad you can join us. I'm Quinn Buckner. Huh? Welcome to Connecticut. Another game that looks pretty good. I mean, this is... I, okay, which team am I? <laughs> okay, I'm clearly not... Uh, 31. Penetrate. I'm not UConn. Huh. Or maybe I am. Shit, I'm not playing this at all. <laughs> Take it to the rim. Jump shot. Got it. I'm not playing this at all. Is this a an actual demo? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> okay, I'm doing nothing that's happening here. 42 from outside. Knocks it home. You'd think it would automatically throw control to you, whoever has the ball. But it doesn't. I have no control over any of these characters. Alright. Alright, I hate to have another one where I skip out. But there wasn't even a demo there. Unless I was doing something wrong, it was playing the game for you. But it wasn't playing a video. It was just taking an AI control over. Siphon Filter 2. Okay. Finally. Something. Worth something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Siphon Filter 2, I think, may have been the only Siphon Filter game that I played all the way through. And I never owned it. It was uh, a cousin loaned it to me. And that was way back when. Now, I played the, I think, in an earlier Demo Disc Theater episode, I played the demo of the first Siphon Filter. Siphon Filter 2 was... I, I mean, I ended up owning the original Siphon Filter, but I didn't play all the way through it. Oh, jeez. Skipped out. <laughs> Not doing that again. I was probably in 2000 that I played Siphon Filter 2. I mean, not the demo, the actual game. And the cousin brings it over and we're playing it with, because um, it was had a deathmatch mode. And we were doing that. Are you there? Leon, you okay? It's about time you checked in. My adrenaline shot is wearing off, but I've got enough strength to come and get you. All right. I'm almost at the crash site now. Once we have those data disks, we can bargain with the agency for your vaccine. <laughs> I'm on the way. Another game series that looked good for the, uh... Oh, shit. Ugh. Another game series that looked good for the PlayStation 1. I, it, give me a minute. I gotta figure out how to control this. Okay, there we go. I think I got it. Oh, really? Really, Gabe? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Definitely... A uh, PlayStation 1 game, and far as its bizarre controls go. I'm sure I could get used to this. Come on, Gabe. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> oh! He got blown up. Let's try that again. Honestly, I don't remember the story much of this. I know the... Um, one of your team members ends up betraying you in the end. Spoiler alert for Siphon Filter. <laughs> Siphon Filter 2. And you have, at the end, you take, like, a Spaz-12, and he's wearing body armor, so your, your gun doesn't actually do any damage. But you shoot at him with the Spaz-12, and it launches him into helicopter blades, and that's how he dies. Wow, dude, you are like the worst. <laughs> this game is so weird. I mean, the way it controls is is definitely not modern. <laughs> but the way that the enemies AI reacts is definitely funky. Compare this to, uh, like, Uncharted 2, where it had the train sequence. I mean, it's two generations of consoles separated, so an enormous change. Really? That's all I got? <laughs> Spring 2000. Okay, I, de I played it in summer of 2000. Let's take it all the way through that one. Twisted Metal 4! Okay. Alright. I was thinking before with um, the intro video, I'd have maybe have uh, Gabe Logan go and run across the screen or something. But now I'm thinking Sweet Tooth will do it. <laughs> Another 989 game. Jeez, they're prolific as fuck. Oh, it's unloading. <laughs> Your loading progress bar is going backwards. Twisted Metal 3, I don't remember being anywhere as good as 2 was. 1 was... 1 was, uh, I mean, it was an interesting game for its era, but it, but it was definitely something of its era.
Twisted Metal 2 was like the second to try, the sophomore effort, and it was a lot better. Hey, like that shit. <laughs> Are you gonna die or? Okay, maybe that wasn't my target. <laughs> The first Twisted Metal was the one that I've ended up playing the most. I played the crap out of Twisted Metal 1. Twisted Metal 2, I don't rem I mean, I, I know I played it, but I, maybe I never owned it. So I didn't end up playing it a lot. Twisted Metal 3, I know I never owned. I remember thinking it looked good, which I don't know why I thought that now. <laughs> All the environments look so samey. Twisted Metal 2 was much more varied. Oh, you bastard. Gotcha. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Come back here and die like a man. Jeez. This is so difficult to control. I guess it's balanced by the fact that the AI is so bad. Oh, I'm getting fucked up. Um... Is this just like a deathmatch? Honestly, it's been a long time since I played the Twisted Metals for real. So, I don't know if... I Are you just tossed into a map and expected to kill everybody? And then once everybody's dead, then you're done? That must have been it. Because... I'm Now that I think about it, I'm not recalling any anything deeper gameplay like uh, objectives than that. And I died. <laughs> oh, I have lives left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Die, damn it. Oh, that's Calypso there. Calypso is a playable character in this game. Got one, finally. <laughs> It's difficult to control. It's difficult to target anybody. Oh, got another one. It's difficult to target anybody. It's difficult to control. And then, on top of that, enemies take so many hits. It's actually making me a little bit nervous, actually. <laughs> I can't say why. I mean, it's, it's too hot in the room I'm in. That's probably what's happening. <laughs> I'm like six feet away from my heating system, which probably isn't good for my computer. But, uh, I'm not known for making good decisions. I mean, I've made a, a YouTube series for a decade that no one watches. Clearly, I'm not the best at making good decisions in life.
What is happening? <laughs> How do I reverse? There's some missiles. You know, I don't even know who I'm playing as. Alright, we get the point. Back and out. Twisted Metal 4. That wasn't even Twisted Metal 3. That was Twisted Metal 4. Crash Team Racing. I remember this being pretty good. Of course, everybody's going to make the obvious comparison to Mario Kart. Mario, Mario Kart... Uh, I mean, Mario Kart 64 I wasn't a big fan of. The original Mario Kart was my my thing. Although it occurs to me that m most people uh, of my generation gravitated towards 64. But Crash Team Racing was Sony's answer to that, or uh, not really Sony's answer, I guess it was Universal or Naughty Dog's answer to that. And it's sort of like the uh, Chocobo Racing game that was pretty good. But it was never going to get the credit it deserved because it's always going to get the comparison to, to Mario Kart. This actually even looks better than Chocobo Racing. Ah, uh, oh. I have analog control. This does look pretty good. I mean, it definitely has the kind of hallmark PlayStation 1-ness to it. I don't know. I'm going to have to go and compare this to Mario Kart 64. If I had to take a guess at looking at this, I'd say overall. I mean, then again, I'm not looking at like this running on native hardware. I'm running this on an emulator, which is operating at a higher resolution than the actual game did. But I would say that just from the glance that I'm looking at it here, that this might actually look better than Mario 60 or Mario Kart 64 did. I know that's blasphemy. Anybody thinks that a PlayStation 1 game is going to look better than an N64 game gets ostracized like, like you're a leper or something. But it was one of those things. A lot of people look at the N ah oh shit, <laughs> look at the N64 as being the vastly more powerful machine in that generation. And, and it was in a lot of ways. Um, it had a more advanced graphics processor in the sense that it could do better texture mapping and it had anti-aliasing capabilities and all that kind of stuff. It could do better texture mapping in the sense that it had texture filtering that was better than what Sony could pull off. And it, uh, the quicker loading times and the fact that it could stream data off its, um, storage a lot faster than Sony's machine could off the disc. Gave it a lot of advantages. But it had a few disadvantages, such as like texture resolution and stuff like that. So it wasn't just in all out, the N64 was a better machine. Plus, Mario Kart 64 was a fairly early, if I remember correctly, a fairly early N64 game. Whereas this releasing in the year 2000 was several years into the PlayStation 1 cycle. So it's... Oh, shit. <laughs> Audrey, no! Pretty late in the PlayStation 1's dev cycle, so you could say that this was um, after years of experience in the machine that could really stretch it to its limits, whereas Mario Kart 64 was... For the dev team that made it, may have been their first effort on that machine. Look at those wheels. I mean, the they has, there's a lot of... They almost look like they are... I mean, they're definitely 2D sort of billboarded sprites. But they have a lot of frames of rotation to have in there. Okay, I finished. <laughs> Crash Team Racing. 
crash that's going to keep going? <laughs> So it was a four-player game, huh? Spyro 2! Spyro, another series that really pushed the PlayStation 1. Definitely did a demo for Spyro 1 in a previous episode of the series. Universal had this. Insomniac! Apparently, Sony owns Insomniac now. They didn't, at this point, and didn't for a long time. But Insomniac was most known for making PlayStation games. What was all that? Sony owns Insomniac now. Now, they don't own Spyro. Because Universal owns Spyro. And they made, uh, like, Skylanders out of it. Another game series. I mean, both, all of the Spyros looked really great on the PlayStation 1. This is just, uh, why are the dragons trying to kill him? <laughs> hey, Tink! Oh, okay, I can't kill you then. <laughs> You're not an enemy. The kind of game that you wouldn't think was possible on the PlayStation, given what a lot of other developers were limited to. But, you know, Insomniac managed to make it, make it happen. Insomniac always managed to impress me with the kind of stuff that they could do. Just like Naughty Dog did. So Insomniac, what other stuff? They, they, Insomniac were the ones that did Resistance, right? Another another solid series, but not the kind of thing that people really remember so fondly as being like true classics of the first-person shooter genre. They did uh, what was it Xbox game? Uh, like the sort of platformer that was really goofy. Came out on the Xbox One. This is, of course, back before Sony bought them. Uh, Sony's not making an Xbox One game, if they can help it. I'm lost. <laughs> hey! Pebbles! I'm back here! Come back here. I'm gonna toast you. Camera control is still a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean the it just must not have been something that occurred to people hey, at the time. Dragon, I hear you're pretty tough. I bet my cousin Glug you wouldn't be able to make it through Badlands without getting singed. Challenge accepted. The um, dual analog sticks of the DualShock and the analog controller definitely existed by this point on the PlayStation 1. But I'm guessing a lot of developers had a couple of things limiting them where they didn't, uh, they didn't want to spend a lot of time optimizing for a controller that may not be owned by everybody. In fact, it certainly wasn't owned by everybody. And... I mean, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, you know? So, we may look at it nowadays saying, like, well, the dual analog control method was definitely the way to go. I mean, it just makes a lot more sense. Control movement along one axis with the... with the, uh, left stick, and then camera control with the right stick. So, that's great. But, it wasn't so obvious until someone did it the first time. Oh, okay, just bounced right off pebbles. Oh. Whoops. Do I go this way? Things are only obvious after someone does it. <laughs> I 
You know, I'm trying to think of when we started to see games that controlled that way. I know Medal of Honor had a control scheme that was surprisingly similar to... Oh, okay, I gotta get up there. Similar to the way modern first-person shooters control on consoles. But it... It was a little awkward. It doesn't quite feel modern. Was it perhaps uh, the Call of Duty games that released on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox that... Spyro, our village is being overrun by lava lizards. Can you get rid of them before they eat my little buddies? I'll lower the bridge for you so you can get over there. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Heh. <laughs> Oh, so I gotta torch him. Oh! I fucked up. <laughs> I failed. Ah. All right. Trying to limit how long these episodes get. I got to keep them under an hour. And in fact, an hour is probably too long. MTV Music Generator. Oh my God. This is actually a demo that I spent a bit of time with. I remember this. Um, it is a... It's a console version with an MTV branding of a PC software that goes by a different name. It's not called MTV Music Generator. Oh, yawn. Sorry. <laughs> and I've tried the PC version. It's got a lot more features and all that kind of stuff because it's not running on a freaking console. Or at least maybe, maybe the MTV version came first and then it started going by a different name. These kind of things are, there's a lot of these kinds of um, things where you can sort of mash together music. I don't have the control. Oh, okay. All right, so how does that, how do we play that? Play, play, play. Okay. All right, so I need to put riffs in there. How do I... Okay. Load that up. There's probably some big limitation on how many things you could load, because the PlayStation 1 doesn't have an ass ton of memory. All right, so. I don't know what this sounds like, <laughs> but I'm just going to throw a lot of random crap in here. Just to, uh, just to get, uh, I can't choose a lot of things because it's just a demo version. They don't want you having access to the entire game, of course. Not that this is really a game. It's sort of like a toy, a music toy. All right, let's play this. Actually, it doesn't sound terrible. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Okay, that's terrible. <laughs> Everything was good until that uh, last piece, or at least surprisingly good, considering I'm only slapping this together without even listening to it. Test drive cycles. Don't... I mean, I know the test drive series. I don't remember there being a motorcycle version. Is this just a video? Man's quest for thrills and chills and spells. Keep it going. Listen to those roaring wheels. All right, yeah, the test drive series was something I was aware of, but wasn't a fan of and may never have played. Uh, I don't remember there being a motorcycle racing version. It's one of those things that you'd think there'd be a big market for, but there really isn't. Licensed bikes, huh? Actually, I ride motorcycles, but I can't see myself spending money on playing a game with them. Haven't actually ridden my bike in um, quite a while. I mean, in at least a year. The whole COVID thing fucked up a lot of leisure activities. I mean, not that riding a motorcycle put you in danger of catching COVID-19. Just, it's one of those things that just uh, didn't get time to. I mean, my job kind of... Uh, demanded a lot of us <laughs> so I for the past year I've worked I mean uh, usually like 60 hour weeks which one also one of the reasons why I've been um, negligent on this YouTube channel is this just starting over <laughs> I guess it doesn't look bad for a uh, yes one okay it started over again <laughs> Vigilante A. Oh, is this a video or a gameplay? I hope it's gameplay. Hope it's gameplay. No, it's not. Vigilante 8. I mean, you know what? I probably never played, since this is a video and not a demo, I probably never played the second game. But I thought the first Vigilante 8 was actually better than Twisted Metal. It's another one of those... Uh, Blast for me things to say, but I thought Vigilante 8 was better than Twisted Metal. I mean, it was a later gen game, and Single Track made the good Twisted Metal games. 989 made the bad Twisted Metal games, and by the time whoever made Vigilante 8 came along, it was late in the PS1's life cycle, so they had more handle on the hardware, all that kind of stuff. I saw that it looked better, I don't know, it, the environments felt larger and more open, so you had more freedom to attack from different angles and all that kind of stuff. Although, to be honest, I'm not sure which version of Vigilante 8 I played, because I know there was an N64 and a PlayStation version. At least I think there was. It was probably the PlayStation version, but I'm not going to rule out the possibility that was the N64 version. Whoa, did you count by a ski lift? <laughs> Was there like a backstory behind Vigilante 8? I don't even know. I guess they're all videos from this point out. Alundra 2? Alundra, Alundra, I'm, I've never known how to pronounce this game. It's also a series that I never played. It was something that I was actually looking into buying. I, as I've... The phrase I've used a million times before. Money is expensive. And when I was a kid, money was even more expensive. Contrail, really? <laughs> the, the crap that comes off of airplane wings? That's what you're naming your studio after? The... Uh, <laughs> money was expensive... And I could only get so many games. So I had to really think hard about what I ended up getting. So demo discs were great for trying things out. But a lot of the games I wanted, 
like say RPGs tended not to have demos for them. Like this is a video, not a demo. So I was looking in like, oh, okay. I was looking into getting the first first game in this series, however it's pronounced. And I narrowed it down to that or the game Breath of Fire 3. Well, I chose the Breath of Fire 3. Now, it does seem like from what people say, neither choice was a bad choice. But because of that, I've never played a Lunder. Maybe it's something I should give a try. I mean, maybe it's something that hasn't aged well. I mean, this is a sequel. So this is one I never even considered buying. I'm pretty sure the first one... If, pretty sure the first one was a 2D game. So the second one was a 3D game. I wonder if... I wonder if that had a... Uh, positive effect on it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's the end of this one. Which one episode, what issue was this? Was this issue 30? Hmm. I mean, I know I haven't done 30 episodes of the series, but... Uh, eventually, when I get to the PlayStation 2 demo discs... Like, well, this one was spotty. This The PlayStation 1 OPM discs are going to be spotty and have been, because I didn't have a subscription to this magazine in the PlayStation 1 era. I would just buy the newsstand, and that was an expensive way of doing it, but things kept happening. Like, I once put, like, uh, mailed out, multiple times I mailed out the subscription card that you get the magazine and it just never took effect. The check was never cashed. Something happened. I don't know. But the, it was never... It wasn't meant to be. By the time I eventually managed to get a subscription to the magazine, it was a PlayStation 2 era. So I got a lot more of the PS2 demo discs. But it's going to be even more spotty in terms of which discs I have. Because I didn't keep them as well organized. I put the PS1 demo discs in a CD wallet and it's sitting next to me right now. So I have like immediate access to all of those. The PS2 demo discs, I know I must have kept them, but um, I'm not sure where they are. I found a good 10 of them, but I know I have way more than that. So once I eventually graduate out of the PS1 and the PS2, I'm gonna try and keep this series going. But, I mean, I don't know how long I can keep it up, because I just don't have the discs. And I'm not gonna, like, try to download them or anything like that. Anyway, that was, uh, Demo Disc Theater episode 12, perhaps? Shit, I don't even know. Well, thanks for watching.